Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm an alcoholic. My name is Charles. Hi, family. I'm mighty glad to be back in Baltimore. I always did think a lot of Baltimore AA, mainly because AA always treated me so nice in Baltimore. And then I met Jesse Kay and his lovely wife, and she's the best cook in the whole world. I mean, bar none. I, I and, and the number two cook. <laughs> If I don't say this, I don't eat supper, you know. Her breakfast is Joe Osick's wife. And uh, uh, I've been treated so beautifully on this visit with them and, and their beautiful children and the cats, but the dog hadn't accepted me yet. <laughs> and, uh, which, which ain't too bad because actually... Uh, I'm always glad when anybody likes me because there were so many years that nobody would have anything to do with me. And when anybody accepts accepts me, uh, I'm tickled to death. So I hope that when I get through here tonight, you will have accepted me. I, I see a lot of faces in here that I haven't seen before, and I see some familiar faces. You know, that reminds me, sometimes you go to a place and they'll introduce you to a new alcoholic. They ain't no new alcoholic. They all use. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, they all damn near used up. And I was no exception. I I came I didn't I didn't come to AA actually. I was brought. See when you get down as low as I was, you don't go nowhere. You either brought or sent. And, and, and I, they, and I did, they didn't even send me. They had to come and got me. I was in the state hospital for nervous diseases in Little Rock, Arkansas. And there was two fellas come out there, said my mother sent them, and, and I thought they was patients with ground privileges, and they had just come in there to heckle me. And, and then they said something about, they knew how they could get me out of there, and I started listening. And sure enough, I had a hearing and uh, just about the next day. And uh, I, the way it was, they had a table. About, it wasn't as long as this, but they set me up here and they had a psychiatrist here and one there and one over there and one there and one there. And I'm sitting there and this, uh, they were all men except one was a woman. And she had a head of hair looked like a bed hadn't been made up in about a week, you know. And they all look weird, and they ask you a question, and, and see, I really don't have a southern accent. I just talk slow. And the reason I talk slow is because I can't think no faster. <laughs> and I always say, oh, before I say anything, and this, this guy asked me something, and I say, oh, uh, and then the next one says something. And then I never did get to answer a question. Went all around the table to it. Finally, I said, hell with this. And that must have been the right answer. Because they let me go. And I got drunk on the way home, which was natural, you know, to celebrate. And actually, now, uh, see, I done started talking and, and don't have no subject. That's the way I always do. So when I get through tonight, say, what I'll do is, is kind of watch my clock, and, and when the time is up, I'll quit. And I ain't gonna say nothing. Don't, I mean, don't look for nothing. My, my story is so long, I haven't heard it all myself. And, and I just start in talking and, and, and wind up. And, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, a fella told me one time, he says, uh, every time I hear you talk, you say something different. And that's the truth. It's basically the same what we all say. I think everybody that gets up before one of these microphones is saying the same thing. I needed help and you gave it to me and I sure am glad. And I think if I, if I went and sit down right now, 
that would be about the gist of what's in everybody's heart that ever presented themselves to an Alcoholics Anonymous group. But it, it all comes so differently, and, and it's all presented so differently, and from such different angles, that the first thing you know, we're in it before we realize it. And we're surrounded, and, and our whole life is wrapped up in Alcoholics Anonymous and what it stands for. And it seems to stand for the same thing for everybody that I've ever seen, yet everybody presents it in a different way because we came from different walks of life. And, and I believe that everybody has a, a ladder of life. And I, I believe that there are high-bottom drunks and low-bottom drunks. I, I remember when I first came in, I didn't know what that meant. And there was a lady talking one night, nice-looking lady, and she said she was very sensitive about her bottom. And I laughed. I thought, I thought that was the funniest thing I ever heard. And they told me after the meeting I wasn't supposed to laugh at that. You know. And then I said, well, what the hell is this business about high bottoms and low? What difference does it make where it is anyhow? What's that got to do with drinking? He said, don't have nothing to do with drinking. He said, that's where you stop. He said, now, some folks have great tall, long ladders. Reach way up into the ethereal, like like you, the general manager or, or chairman of the board of some great big corporation. Man, you running around way up on, on some rung of some tall ladder up there that maybe a fellow like you can't hardly see up in months there. And they can trace up and down, make off. They can come way down before you have noticed it, you know. And, and their children still wearing shoes, and their large dues all paid up, and nobody knows they're in trouble. And then there's folks with shorter ladders. I mean folks like salesmen and school teachers and bricklayers and taxpaying type folks, you know. <laughs> them. They they still got a right long ladder too, and they can can make a whole lot of mistakes before it becomes apparent to society. And, and their children are still wearing shoes. And said, so then there's folks that got right short ladders. These folks about to lose their job, and and they're they're in debt and all this. And then there's other folks with shorter ladders than that that have done lost their job, and their wife left. And and they looking for a job, or looking for a way to keep from getting a job. And and he said, and then there's folks like you. <laughs> and and it hurt my feelings, you know, because I figure I'm just a regular, ordinary, garden variety, everyday type drunk. But he pointed out that I had one of the shortest ladders he ever seen, <laughs> and it was sitting in a hole. <laughs> That's a fact. And matter, and matter of fact, he said to me one day, see, when I, when I was brought in to AA, see, I didn't join AA, I was just kicked out of everything else. And when I brought in there, well, I, I didn't work nowhere, and they was giving me 50 cents for a flop, and, and you know, give me some soup. In those days, what, they had a table, something like this, and everybody sat around that table and talked about everybody wasn't there. And, uh, and I was always in Chris, even one day we were sitting around there, and Jesse, I show him, where is Jesse? Jesse? Where the hell? Oh, way back there. Uh, Y'all ain't smoking around Jesse, are you? If you are, hold your cigarette where you go in your own nose. Um, so Jesse ain't supposed to be. Jesse gave me these cost drops. I, I couldn't have handled it without that. Anyway. See, I forgot what I was talking about, and that don't make no difference. I'll just keep on talking anyhow. <laughs> but anyway, uh, when I was brought into AA, well, they kept giving me stuff, give me something to eat, and I thought, man, this is what I've been looking for all my life, something for nothing. Because they said no dues and no fees, and I didn't have no dues, no, no fees either. I figured if it was any membership, I'd charge it. <laughs> And and they pass that a basket. Just be in a group where they would say, uh, "We're gonna pass the basket now, and if, if you need anything, just take it out." And the damn basket had just passed me. And 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 uh, I mean, I thought you was the greatest group of people in the world. We'd sit around these tables and talk about everybody wasn't there. And 
One day I said to one of these holy men, been sober about a month, I said, ain't we gossiping? He said, young man, in AA you do not gossip. This is constructive criticism. <laughs> well, I didn't know the difference between constructive criticism and gossip, and I kept on gossiping. <laughs> and it worried me, concerned me about me gossiping, and I asked the good Lord to help me do something about that, and he did. He got me where I couldn't remember nobody's name. <laughs> so if I don't remember your name, well, don't worry about it. It's just because I don't want to gossip about you. <laughs> and you can't gossip about, oh, what you call it. Ain't no way. You try it sometimes. Say, man, did you hear about, oh, what you call it? The who? You know, that, that what you call it. Say, hell, man, get away from me. I don't know <laughs> what you call it. You can't gossip about, no, what you call it. And... And I, I sort of started in AA just like I did at home. See, I was raised during the Depression, and we was poor, good. Everybody was poor in them days, but my folks overdone. <laughs> we was. We were so poor, we didn't have enough cover when it would be a cold night. Uh, but we did have dogs, and I'd pull up a dog. <laughs> and I have seen a night that would be so cold, I have seen a three-dog night. <laughs> And and they they didn't raise me. I just hung around till I grew up. And, and but you you learn a whole lot that way. You 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 meet a whole lot of different uh, uh, problems. And if you don't solve them, you die. See, there was nothing. Actually, I left Arkansas before I found out we was in a depression. Folks got to talking about it. Hell, we was used to it. You know, we just raised up something and ate it, or shot it, and skinned it and ate it. And the first time I ever took a drink, I was out hunting, I was 16 years old, and I, I'd seen them men go back and feel the wheat. You, you see them do that, and come back, and they didn't, they was feeling their oats when they got through feeling the wheat. And I knew there was something back then, but I never had had a drink, and I was 16 years old, and I was out hunting, and I seen some smoke going up in a, in a little neck of woods back there. And I seen a fella, and what he was doing was working off a batch in a still, and had a thump cake going, and this worm coming down, go drip, 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 in a great big tin cup type thing, you know. And this fella was lonesome all by himself. He seen me, and he figured he got company. So he said, hey, come over here. Got something free. I said, free? Yeah. Well, I went over. I'd have, you know, if it had been an alligator, I'd have ate it. Skin, <laughs> ate it. And went over there, and he just handed me this tin cup. He said, try this. Now, I never had drank none of that white light. I hadn't had, I just chugged a lugged it. Drank it. I thought I'd never breathe again. <laughs> that stuff did something to me. And, man, you ever seen a, a rag fall to the ground? That's where I, man, I was, I was on the ground, and, and this guy standing looking at me like wondering how long it's going to be before he died. <laughs> and I was going to die, too. I, my, my both eyes was trying to get in the same socket. <laughs> and I was turning all kinds of different colors, and my heart was faster than that thump cake was going, and that thing still going dip, 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 down in that can. He was holding that can, you know. And finally my heart started beating kind of normal, and, and I worked my way up and got up. He said, try her again. She got some age on her. <laughs> now, that was my social drinking. Lasted about 30 minutes. Because 30 minutes after he gave me that first drink, I had shot his mule. <laughs> Graveyard dead. And I was running out across the swamp with a, a Dominica rooster he had, and he's shooting at me. And my social drinking was over. I got plumb home before I passed out in the backyard where we raised chicken. Now, I don't know if you ever passed out in a chicken lot or not, but, man, you're a mess. We raised these Rhode Island Reds. And they are squirters. <laughs> and my mother came out in the backyard and found me, and she never had seen me looking like that before. 
In fact, she never had seen anybody looking like that before and took me in the house and gave me the only therapy she knew, a hot bath and a dose of castor oil and an enema. I was the cleanest drunk in Arkansas, inside and out. And if I'd have had any sense at all, I'd have quit drinking right there because, man, I was some wonderful sick. You know, they say alcoholics got a weak stomach. That ain't necessarily so. Because I could lay on my back and puke right straight up in the air, but my reflexes were slow, and I couldn't duck it. I'd be still there when it come down. And from that day to this, I was a sloppy drunk, always. And, and you know, being poor like I was, wasn't working nowhere, I roomed in my overcoat. And, and when you room in your overcoat, it, you know, you can't... Uh, well, you can imagine salt and pepper in one pocket and a razor and a bar of soap in the other, and that's it. You know, you don't even have to call the dog to move because you ain't got no dog. You can't afford a dog. And that was the kind of a drunk I was, under the bridge. That's after my mother told me, son, I want you to leave home. And I I looked at her, and I thought, my God, here she's going to wean me, and I'm only 30. Did just sent me right out in the world. This was along about I don't have you ever been in a nut house? Don't raise your hand. I'm no embarrass nobody. But see, I got to the point where they still let me stay at home but wouldn't let me carry a key to the front door. Had to knock to get in your own house. Come up nice and drunk, just comfortable drunk. Walk up on the front porch, knock on the door, and some member of your own family open the door and say, Yeah. <laughs> Now, what the hell do you mean, yes? Open the door and let me in. I live here. Yeah, but you're drunk. I know I'm drunk. If I ain't drunk, I wasted a lot of money on whiskey. Now, let me in the house and go on back mumbling in your room about I'll buy the damn house and run them all off, you know, stuff like that. I was always going to buy a bar room and fire the bartender. Always things like that I was going to do, but I was at the point then where I wore long-handled underwear, winter and summer. In the summer, I would drop the flap for ventilation, you know, because I was smart. I always was smart. That is by my standards. The more I think about that, I may have to change that, Joe. I don't, I don't know whether I was so smart or not. But I lived. You know, I, that is, I existed. I didn't die, and I guess I considered that being smart. Because there was folks dying, you know, falling off a bridge. I fell off a bridge one time. Come to think of it, I don't know what I was doing up there, but I fell off. <laughs> Down in amongst the willow trees and a Mr. River, lived in Arkansas in that Arkansas River. They took me to the hospital and kept me in there for 40 days before I woke up. And they done give me the last rites and the next to last rites and then the last rites again. Because I'd come to, you know, and mumble something and, leave, and drift off again. And they thought I'd done contacted something. I skinned up all over and they thought somebody beat me up. And what had happened, uh, these comfort pellets had come in. And I don't know if, if you ever had any of them, uh, uh, barbitol, luminol, anything at all. You know, and, and, uh, you could buy them in them days for 25 cents a dozen, didn't need no prescription, and I was introduced to them, and, and along with white lightning, man, they send you about four feet off of the ground, float around a little rock, and land up in jail and get out before you know you're in. And and I fell off of the bridge. That's how that happened. I don't know why I brought that up, but maybe I just wanted to hear it again. I guess that's what it was. Anyway, I got down uh, in, in Monroe, Louisiana one time. You talk about total recall. I can remember the very first drink of Rubby Dub that I drank. I was in Monroe, Louisiana drinking Sweet Lucy. And, Lord, I was nice and drunk. I'd been up north, and I was wearing one of them coats, you know, with a sheep line coat, and it was in July, and I was down in Monroe, hotter than hell down there, and the police come up and just grabbed me by the arm and, and didn't say a damn word. And we went up to the judge, and the judge looked at me and didn't say nothing but 30 days. And he he was one of them comic judges, you know, 30 days has September, April, June, and you, you know. One of them kind of funny judges, you know. And I went in this, uh, this, uh, 
uh, jail atmosphere in there where all them guys was way out looking like that. I knew there was something different. I said, what's with y'all? And one of them boys that was more lucid than the rest of them said, we coasted. I said, on what? He said, goofball. I said, give me some. <laughs> well, that boy handed me one of them little pellets. And I got to coasting, but my sled was slicker than hell. And, and, and uh, my, 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 my hill was steep or something. Anyway, they affected my extremities. And I, I, I man, I, I was grounded. Cause when I go to reach my arm out for something, my arm just sat there, but my leg run out on the stem. And, and I was grounded for 30 days and every two hours we would have our medication. And for 30 days I just sat there and coasted and they said, come in one day, say, your time is up and I couldn't go. <laughs> and two great big policemen come and got me and one under each arm and set me out on the front porch said, when you able to leave. And I remember, I went down to a place called Five Corners, got me another bottle of that sweet Lucy, and whoo, I was drifting again. Coasting. Way out. I was waiting for a train. Now, I was at a crossing where the red dog crosses the L and N, and, and when a train comes to another train's track, they got to stop. That's a law. And then start up. And I would be sitting there 10 feet from the from the train, and a, a, a freight train with 100 cars would come up, boom, stop, and then start off, and get the hell away from there before I'd ever notice it. <laughs> I was really gone on that sweet Lucy again, and I finally got on a train and got over in Mississippi. Now, if you're on the bum, don't go to Mississippi. The jackrabbits carry their lunch when they go to Mississippi. <laughs> I was sitting on, on, a, on a levee on a railroad track. Oh, I was something wonderful sick. And this bum come up and looked at, I should have said this other bum, come up and looked at me and he said, you look sick. I said, I am sick. And he said, if you got 25 cents, I know where we can get a drink. And I had 25 cents. I handed it to him, held his coat for security. He went off somewhere and come back with a package wrapped up in drugstore paper. And you know them yellow paper. I thought, he must have credit or something somewhere. Anyway, he undone that package and loosened that cap on it and handed it to me. He said, take the, the fusel oil off of this. And I looked at it. It says, rubbing alcohol, if taken internally, serious gastric disturbances will result. And they did. <laughs> but I never had drank any rubby dub. And I, I said, no, no, I, I'm afraid, afraid to, to drink. I'm afraid I... I'd be sick. He said, hell, I never seen anybody sick on you anyhow. And he went ahead and took a slug of that. And the first thing you know, man, he was dancing and prancing, scratching, shaking hands. I said, give me the bottle. <laughs> and he handed me that bottle of rubber dub and I took a great big slug of it and lost it. And he said, that ain't no way to drink rubber dub. The way you drink rubber dub is take just a little bit of it in your mouth and hold it there until the saliva dilutes it. I tried it. It worked. It was my first mixed drink. <laughs> Man, I'm telling you, when that stuff took a hold, you know, there ain't nobody in the world loves one another like two drunks. And man, me and this old boy took up housekeeping underneath a bridge. Oh, it was nice. We had packing cases to sleep on. And we had running water, cross ventilation, everything going good. The local constabulary didn't know what we was doing. And the local citizenry was very sympathetic to our needs. We was nickeling up in the local grocery store and the bacon butts was flowing like wine, and we was living it up. But finally, there was two officers came down and relieved of us, us of all responsibility. 
We, we was taken to the jail with 30 days, and you talk about sick, and I don't know if you've ever been on rubber dub or not, but you, you stink. You stink something wonderful. And I thought it was him. And he thought it was me. And them other prisoners knew who it was. And we was ostracized. And this old boy had been in that, that jail before, and he said to me, Charlie, I know this jailer. He's a nice man. And he says, you tell him you got a bad leg. And he will saturate a piece of cotton with rubbing alcohol, and we will squeeze it in this quart milk bottle and put a little water in it and have a nice drink. So Mr. Carroll came up to check on us, and I said, Mr. Carroll, I, I, I have been injured, and I have got a bad leg. Do you think, please, sir, that you could give me something, maybe to rub on it, that would ease the pain? He said, why, certainly, son. I always help out a young man. He went down, got a whole pint, and just handed it to me. We poured it in that milk bottle and filled it up with water and just folded them components together so it wouldn't bruise. Pretty soon we was coasting again. And when that run out, I said, Mr. Carroll, I have run out of medication. Could you please give me another bottle? Why, certainly, son. Give me another bottle. When I run out of that, I said, Mr. Carroll, I've run out of rubbing alcohol. He gave me another bottle. When I run out of that, I said, Hey, boy! <laughs> bring up some more rubber dust. <laughs> oh, no. He, he hit that top landing. He looked at me and said, You look worse now than you did when they brought you in here. <laughs> Let me see your leg. I hadn't even had any water on it, much less rubbing alcohol, and he cut us off. You talk about sick and 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 low bottom drunk. I done found a new hole. <laughs> oh my God! And you know, you talk about police brutality. They made us do the rest of that thirty days on nothing but food and water. <laughs> We got out of that jail. We walked out on that front porch. And in Greenville, Mississippi, where you do your jail, your jail sentence in that county, they got great big oak trees out in the front. And you would have thought, now, while we sobered up there in that jail, we got to talking about our families and where he lived and how nice it'd be to be back there with them. And when we get out while well, we'd grab a freight train and go on home and straighten up. Me and this old boy got out together and walked out through that, that great big front courtyard of that courthouse and didn't say a damn word to one another. We just walked right up to the dime store and got another bottle of Rubby Dove. And an hour later, we were sitting on a freight train with our legs swinging out that side door singing them songs, you know, on our way again. To nowhere. How come we did that? How come you did what you did to escape reality? I don't know. And you don't either. Every one of you, when you apply retrospect, I like to call it looking in my rear view mirror. See, we all travel that same road, that same boulevard of broken dreams. You remember, if you've been to church, you heard a sermon on a lost sheep and the 99 that didn't stray, and that shepherd set sail and left all them 99 sheep and went after that one little lost sheep. I used to try to figure out what happened. And I figured while I was drinking, that little sheep was like me. He was hip. 
And one day, he's out there eating grass with the rest of them sheep, and he backed off from the bunch. And he said, look at them woolies. All they do is eat grass and wiggle their tails and go, ah, man, that ain't my bag. I'm going to split. I'm going to cut out and go out with the wolves where the action is. And he left. You think that's how that was? No. Uh-uh. See, that little sheep loved to be there with his mother and his father and his sibling, his brother and sister sheep. And that little sheep wanted to eat grass. He liked grass. And he wanted to wiggle his tail because he was brought up and educated in tail wiggling. See, that's the only subject they had in them days for sheep, just tail wiggling and going back. And he was good at going, ah, he liked that. And he liked to listen to them other sheep. Ah, 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 ah. And that was home. He loved that. But one day, while he was out there grazing with all the rest of the flock, he run across some grass that wouldn't quit. I mean... When he got a hold of that grass, that made him feel like he was a ram that tall with horns run way out here. And he could not only go, ah, he could beller. Whee! He seen some more of that grass over there. And he went over and got that and ate that too. And some more. And some more. Over there. And way over there was some more. And way over there was some more of that nice grass. But the first thing you know, he listened. And he didn't hear a sound. And he raised his head and he looked all around. He turned all the way around and there wasn't another sheep in sight. And he was scared. He was scared away down deep in the dark recesses of his very soul. And he cried out for help. And the only way he knew that was that plaintive little cry. The only way he knew But the shepherd had missed him. And the shepherd was listening for this little cry for help. And he had to wait until the little sheep cried out because he didn't know which way he had gone. But as soon as he heard the little sheep, he came for him. And he had his rod and his staff. And do you think that when he approached the little sheep, Do you think that he held his rod and his staff high and went up shouting and stomping his feet in a threatening manner and looked at him and said, Where the hell have you been? Damn, if we ain't had the police looking for you all night. Get your ass home. (laughs) Uh Uh-uh, that ain't the way the shepherd did that. You see, the shepherd knew that the little sheep was frightened. And he knew how badly frightened. And when he came upon this little sheep's body, lying there in the little bloodshot eyes, looking up at him, he approached him with his rod and his staff, but ever so gently and ever so tenderly, he reached down and he gathered the little sheep up in his arm and he held him close to his breast whispering reassuringly to him all the time that he loved him and he wanted him and he needed him and he missed him. And very carefully and quietly and softly, he held him and patted him and loved him all the way back to the flock. And when he got back to the flock, he set the little sheep down amongst his own kind. And even then he didn't leave. He stayed there so that he could comfort him in his fear. To remind you anybody you know? That's right. That was me. And it was you and you. And you and you. See, you were like me. You wanted to be with your family. You wanted to be loved and you wanted to love in return. And you wanted to be dependable and responsible and responsive to the needs 
of those you love. But one day, you found a drink, and this drink made you feel tall and strong and smart and plumb, flat, pretty. I mean, can you imagine me with two teeth? One up here and one down here, and they didn't match. And I used to sit and look in a bar mirror, in that back bar mirror, and shine that top tooth with a napkin. And I didn't have no muscle, but I did have a nerve that jumped. And when that nerve would jump, I would think that looked like a big muscle, and I would say to myself, you dog. <laughs> you were no exception. Somehow or other, you found strength in your newfound friend, alcohol. And over here, you found another drink and another and another. And there was another party over there, but one day, one dark, gloomy, miserable day, you woke up and there was nobody around. You were all alone. And you were hungry inside your very soul to be wanted, to be loved, to be needed. And you cried out because you were lost. And you knew it. You didn't know where to go. And when you cried out, the shepherd was waiting to hear you. And he did. And he came to you. And he didn't threaten. And some shepherd, some good shepherd, sat down on the side of your dirty old bed. And they looked into your bloodshot eyes. And they held your wet, trembling hand, and they used that crooked arm therapy. And as they put their arm around your trembling body and held you close, they told you they loved you, and they needed you, and they asked you to please come with them, that there was a place that you could go together. And solve your problem. That's why you're here. Because the shepherd cared. I remember one time there was a woman said that she didn't believe in God. <clears throat> the shepherd. And this other woman that did believe in a God of her understanding said, What would it take to make you believe that there is a power greater than yourself. She said, just show me a sign. And this woman said, assume an attitude of prayer and close your eyes and you'll feel the hand of God. She knelt, she clasped her hands together, and she closed her eyes, and sure enough, she felt a hand upon her head. But she opened her eyes and saw that it was the hand of this other woman who believed. And she said, ah, oh, that's your hand. She said, oh, yes. God always uses the nearest hand to you. And you're a miracle. You're not a coincidence. And the person sitting next to you is the nearest miracle. And you love that person. Maybe you've never seen that person before, but you love them. And you love them because you need them. And you love them because there's a person that you can relate to. Here's a person that you can share your experience and your strength. And nobody's going to laugh at you. They laugh with you. Oh, but what a difference. And there are no silly questions that you can ask this person who's sitting right next to you right now. You don't have to go way off yonder somewhere to find somebody to share with. 
the person that's sitting next to you right now, whose warmth of their body you can feel is one of the many thousands of persons that you can relate to. And that's what happened when you were brought back and you were set down amongst your own kind. And there's somebody here that's with you to comfort you, to answer your questions. You, you just can't ask a silly question. You can get a lot of foolish answers. <laughs> See, the reason for this is that everybody can do something, but nobody can do everything. And everybody can answer some questions because they've had some ex certain experiences that would fulfill your need in this capacity. But some people can stand back at the door and greet folks as they come in. Some folks can make tapes like Jesse K. And some folks can get automobiles and put people in them and haul them places like Joe has for me for the last four days. And some people can put money in the, in the collection as it passes. And some people can make coffee. There's a whole lot of people in AA that's making coffee that can't make coffee. <laughs> There's a whole lot of people that, that stand at doors to shake hands that ain't the best greeters in the world. And there's, there's folks that can make you happy by coming in the room. And there's others can make you happy by leaving the room. <laughs> and there's a whole lot of folks that can make speeches. And there's a whole lot of folks that are making speeches that can't make speeches, you know. But let me tell you something, you can't be wrong in AA if you're trying to do the best you can. You're doing something that's pleasing God, your God, the same God that somebody that has a God that you don't understand has. That's all the same power, the same beautiful influence that brought you here, the same shepherd that answered your call when you cried out, was the same shepherd that answered my call when I cried out. And it don't make any difference if you're in a nut house. Man told me one time, Charlie, you getting uppity. Now, the reason he said I was getting uppity is because I had done got a job making seven dollars a week. And I had moved out of the flop house into a three dollar a week Hall room with a chair painted on the wall. <laughs> and I done had a shirt I could change into while I was washing one out. And I'm telling, why don't you be like me? For God's sake, get your job. Straighten up and fly right. A man come over to me and he said, Charlie, come here. One of these holy men, you know. He said, man, you're double dumb. I said, how can you be double dumb? He said, you done got up it I said, on the $3 we want you to do is go over in the corner and count yourself. And I mumbled, here's a nut. How in the hell are you going to count yourself and come up with anything but one? Unless you're pregnant. Well, sir, I went over in the corner, and I counted myself, and I come up with one, and I said, Hey, Doug, I counted myself. He said, How many you come up with? I said, One. He said, Think on it, and walked away. Well, I thought he was going to give me some profound information that I could rest my laurels on. And to show you what a slow learner I was, that man had been dead for five years before I figured out what he meant. You see, he wanted me to count myself, and then he wanted me to remember 
He wanted me to look in my rearview mirror and remember the time when I could count myself and come up with nothing. Try it on yourself. Remember? When you sat on the side of that bed and you were afraid to open the door because you couldn't face your own family and you thought you were nothing, you thought you were unworthy of their love and God's love and your own respect, you remember the time you realized that you had lost your own self-respect and you had become a nothing. And now, count yourself again, right now, tonight, here in this room. Count yourself. You came up with one, didn't you? Now, ask yourself one more important question. One what? Oh, I done boggled your mind, I know. <laughs> now ask yourself another question. Yeah, I'm one. There's no doubt about it. Now ask yourself, am I satisfied with that one, me? And the answer is, no, you're not. You better damn sight stay green. Joe or somebody, Doris or somebody was telling me about a chip, a green chip. And a green chip is given to you at nine years. Didn't you say nine years? Nine years of sobriety to make you know that you're still green. But there's more to that than just that. As long as you're green, you grow. When you get ripe, you get rotten. Now, if you done got ripe, you better get green again. And you better not be satisfied with the one that you are. Don't get satisfied. Be dissatisfied. Grow. Learn. Keep an open mind and an open heart. And work with those people. The desiderata says the dull and the ignorant. Listen to their story too. For they too have a need. They, too, are children of God. I'll tell you what you are, every one of you, without exception. You are one child of God, created in His image. And God created you because He wanted you. And He kept you and let you live because he loves you. And as long as you are one, and as long as you realize that there is room for improvement, and as long as you attend these meetings, as long as you and I stay together and lean one upon the other, we're going to grow, and we're going to be eligible for God's love. We are eligible for all the grace that we have received. You know what the word grace means? Unmerited rewards. And all the time in AA meetings you see this sign, but for the grace of God. And it stops there. You finish it because you know what would have happened to you if God had not given you His grace, the grace that you did not earn. You ever notice that when we say the Our Father... We say, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. <clears throat> Did you ever notice somebody? I remember when I had only been sober one day, one 24-hour period, and I was still trembling so that I could have threaded a sewing machine while it was running, if, if I could have got coordinated, you know. <laughs> and I remember a man came over and looked at me, and he said, Man, he said, you're doing a fine job. I said, you crazy as hell. I'm dying, flat dying. And I was, too. I knew it. He said, oh, no. He says, you got over that big hump. You've been sober all day. You have, have endured 24 hours without a drink of any kind, and that makes you a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, as much as anybody. And he was giving me glory, and I thanked him. You mean that? 
you, you mean I'm, I'm much a member of AA as you? He said, you certainly are. I said, oh, thank you, thank you. And I stayed sober a month. I've been sober a whole 30 days. And a guy come over and he says, Ben, he says, you're doing a great job. I said, thank you, thank you. He was giving me glory. Folks shaking my hand right and left, telling me what a good job I was doing. I stayed sober a whole year. And they baked a cake for me, set a candle up on it, let me, me lead the meeting, get my own speaker. And after the meeting, they came up, Charlie, you're doing a great job. I said, I knew it. <laughs> By gosh, I do know it too. And I came here tonight, just like I told you, without a subject. But I came prepared. I came prepared to share all I got. I came here to give you everything that I brought. I came here to tell you I love you. You, you, you. I love you. I love you. You, you. I love you all. And there was a time when I didn't understand this glory. I didn't understand this handshaking and this backslapping. And don't you think I'm condemning it now? Don't ever stop congratulating folks. Don't ever stop telling folks you love them. Even if you're at that point now where you haven't reached that height in this program. There's a whole lot of people that haven't even reached the honesty part of this program. And, and you're broke. You haven't got money enough to buy you a big book. If, you, if you're at that stage and you haven't got the honesty part of the program yet, steal one. <laughs> I mean, we don't have no do's or don'ts in here. You see, nobody come in here because they was right. Everybody come in here because they was wrong. Everybody. But I want you to know I do love you. And I, I, I tell you the truth, too. I, I remember the time when I did not. It was the biggest, roughest looking son bitch you ever seen. Come up to me and looked at me and said, Boy, I love you. I said, I'm married. <laughs> Just like I told you, the time's up. And I ain't got started. But I never have heard all my story yet. I'm going to tell you something. And I want this to apply to you, too. Don't you ever hear all your story. You let your story just keep unfolding. Chapter after chapter after chapter. And keep growing. And keep loving and keep coming back. And please meet me here. And please love me. Because i got to love you. God bless you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.